I'm Justin Martin, welcome to my home in Hanoi, Vietnam, and today we're going to do something fun. I'm going to take you through step by step what it's like to go on a real travel assignment. Now from my experience, I'm going to use 36 hours, the New York Times 36 hours section. For those of you that don't know, they publish these great books, 36 hours, but it's a regular series in the New York Times travel section where basically they pick a city and they tell you what to do, or they pick a town, and they pick a location, and they tell you what to do within 36 hours, hour by hour. Should be fun, stay tuned to check it out. So now I'm gonna go through sort of step by step. So this was a 36 hours of Hoi An, which is in central Vietnam. This assignment, you know, it comes in the middle of the night, a little bit James Bond-like, except the fact that, you know, James Bond's handsome and he wears a tuxedo and he gets all the ladies and all that stuff. But other than that, it's exactly like a James Bond. Now you get this message, they don't tell you too many details about the story. For 36 hours, it's, it's not as covert, so they'll tell you what, where and what you're doing, but they don't give you the whole story until you accept the assignment. They do this because until you accept it, they're just afraid that like another writer or you might even just in discussion, you know, bring it up. This could be a new hotspot and maybe you've got friends and which does happen in a similar circle, similar travel photographers or, or, or travel writers and you leaked it and they're doing the same thing or give someone an idea. Just to avoid all that, they don't give you the details of the assignment until you actually accept it. So I booked my airfare, I got my, I've got the whole story now. The, once I agree to the assignment, they'll send me the full story by the writer. Sometimes this has been done, written by the writer like a year ago. Sometimes it was done a month ago. It's a misconception that you're actually going on the story frequently with the writer. It doesn't really happen that much anymore. On new stuff and big stories, big feature stories, or big investigative pieces, you might go with the writer. If I'm going to a city that I'm unfamiliar with or a country that I don't speak the language well, I will hire a fixer. If it's something I think I can manage on my own, usually 36 hours in travel stories I can manage on my own, but it can be very helpful to have a fixer because they can help you set up all the appointments to go to these places. They can help you understand the best times to go to these places. And then when you're there, they help you understand the story itself. Like if it's you know, a place that does a particular kind of silk weave and they don't speak English and I don't speak the language, then that person can explain it so it does help me on my captions quite a bit because, again, you want to get these stories right. You, you have to get them right. You are a journalist. So going into it, I'm going to look at the story. I'm going to do as much research as possible before I hit the ground. Again, if I'm working with a fixture, they're going to help me with the research, help me with the times, help me with setting up appointments. But I'm going to look at the story as a whole. I'm going to get a list of places I need to shoot. I'm going to get a story. I'm gonna get the written story itself so I get an idea of the mood of the story. Again, these are 36 hours, so the mood is usually pretty similar, but some places are more heavy on nightlife, some places are more heavy on food. So I've got a sense of what the writer wants to talk about. Now, I don't have to go exact word for word. I do, I do have a little bit of room to interpret the story how I want visually, but I need to hit the spots because they're gonna basically list what to do at six o'clock in the morning, what to do at noon, what to do for nightlife, all that stuff. So I need to hit certain spots and the editor might give me a list and say, definitely get these five locations. They always want you to typically get something with food, something with art and culture, um, you know, a general ambiance and architecture, and then nightlife as well. So those things I definitely need to hit. So I make sure that I, I start with those things and then I build on top of that what else I can get. I don't have to get everything on the list, but I try my best to do so. So I'm shooting on Thursday, but I get in, I get in Wednesday. And so I'll shoot as much as I can for sunset. I just look, I look for spots. I try to think, okay, this works now, or maybe this will work for tomorrow. I take notes of everything. I've got a notebook with me. I'm writing down notes. I'm checking off my list as I go. These 36 hours are really scavenger hunts. So like you're shooting off of this list and then you can do stuff off list. So I'm looking for just beautiful shots and shots that tell the story of the location. I want to transport the viewer to this location. I want to, think, I want to get them curious about the location. I like to leave things out too. Like sometimes you don't want to put in everything, because you want a little bit of curiosity, you want a little bit of mystery, you want people to think, oh, what, what, what's that like? Oh, I, that's interesting, I want to know more. But that first day, I shoot sunset, and then I shoot a tiny bit into the night, I'll go have dinner uh, at maybe one of the places on my list, see if I can shoot something you know, at that restaurant on the list, and then I go home, I back everything up. Now, for all you photographers out there, it's important to back everything up. I put it on two different hard drives, and then I even will upload stuff to uh, Dropbox, some of the best shots. So I'll look at my images just because I need to see what I got. I need to make sure there's no problems with my camera, um, no problems with my memory card, no problems with anything like that. So I look to see what I've got so I can always have it in my head building the story because I'm thinking about a layout for print in the New York Times travel section, and I'm also thinking of a layout for a for a story online. So that could be a slideshow or it could just be scrolling down. I need to have you know images that fit well for that and images that fit well for layout. So I'm keeping that in my mind. Do I have a nice 
wide overall shot, something that shows a sense of place, something that shows the food, something that shows the culture. I have this mental checklist in addition to my actual checklist. So that night, I back everything up, get everything ready, pack my bag for the next day, like so I'm ready to go in the morning. I get up for sunrise. At sunrise, I'm just gonna shoot about, I check my app, I have a Sunseeker app. I look to see exactly what time sunrise is. I set my alarm, two alarms so I don't miss it. Uh, so sunrise in Hoi An on Thursday was 5.15, so I'm gonna get up at 4.45 and then set another alarm for five. I really need about like two minutes to get ready. Everything's packed, everything's ready to go. Slam like an in-room coffee if I can, whatever's available. Usually miss breakfast at the hotel because it's too early. So I get out there and shoot. I want sunrise, I want overall ambiance. I usually don't have anything on my list. Most places aren't open, so I'm just trying to get an overall sense of place at sunrise. So Hoi An, I'm going by the river. I'm trying to shoot the buildings. I'm trying to get those shots that show that beautiful riverside architecture and all those shops there. So I'm gonna shoot from about five to eight, as much street stuff as I can, paying attention to the light, paying attention to the people, creating not just a sense of place of Vietnam, but I need to create a sense of place of Hoi An. I need to transport people to Hoi An. So around eight, 8.30, I usually stop for a quick breakfast and a coffee. I drink a lot of caffeine on these shoots. I drink a lot of caffeine in general. That's why I talk like this. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna take a little caffeine break. And then as soon as I'm done with my coffee, I go out and shoot from about 8.30 to 1 p.m. I shoot everything that I know I can get away with in bad light. So anything indoors, uh, museums, temples, things like that. From 1 to 3 p.m., again, since I'm buying these meals, I just tend to eat and shoot at the place I'm eating. So I'll buy, I'll buy some food, I'll buy the dishes that are, the writer talked about. Maybe there's, something, uh, maybe there's something the writer missed that I know about in particular because I've been there before or it's in a country like Vietnam that I might even sometimes know better than the writer or just know something different about the country than the writer. I usually try to shoot the dish by the window, so I pick a seat by the window, I shoot as much as I can. If I need to announce it to the restaurant why I'm there, what I'm doing, I do, because I, if I'm shooting like overall ambiance and it's an intimate place, then I might need to ask permission. Sometimes I'll do that ahead of time, sometimes I'll do it right on the spot, it really depends. I try to plan as much as I can ahead of time, but the schedule will change, and sometimes I have a different plan. I said I was gonna shoot this restaurant, but then I find out it's closed, or, or uh, you know they're under renovation, or they just don't want me to go there now, they change their mind, whatever that is. I need to have a backup plan for, for everything. Around three to 3.15, slam another coffee. <laughs> um, get back out there, shoot again, change if I need to. Sometimes I've sweat so bad because Vietnam is hot and I do get hot easy. I am built for cold weather. I don't know why I live here, but uh, slam another coffee and then I head back out to shoot and get ready to shoot into sunset and into the night. These are really full days. I don't really take breaks. If there is an hour in the afternoon where I can go back to my hotel room and it's close, I might go back stuff up just to have, you know, have it backed up again. Again, I told you guys why I back everything up because you never know. From five to 6.30 or seven into nighttime, into sunset, like I, I pray for good light, I pray for a beautiful sunset, and I hope, I usually have a spot picked out in my mind, something with a nice vantage point where I can capture an overall of the area so I can really tell the story, so I can really create a scene setter, you know, something that could run really big. Just think of a movie, you're introducing like a sense of place and then all your other images, the colors, and, and the way you compose your images, all that's coming together to tell the story. It's the same as a layout, the same as a travel story. So I, I'm, I'm, I've already had a vantage point picked out my mind, I might have already got access for it, I might not have, it depends, or it could be a place where I just go and buy a coffee and then look over the balcony and get the shots that I want. But I hope for a good sunset because I want that beautiful light to create that awesome scene setting shot. 6.30 to 8.30, I'm trying to get all my nightlife stuff. So again, for food, I usually eat my dinner at the place that I'm trying to photograph. I, I pay for it again. I get all my natural shots in there. I want to, If I can just kind of shoot from my table or wander around, I will, again, I will ask permission if I do feel like I'm gonna stick out. Um, but if I can get the shots I need without that, it's, it's better for me because it's gonna be a lot less staged and a lot more natural and less chance of someone saying no. So I get those shots that I need, uh, you know, dinner, nightlife, ambiance overall. If it's, you know, if I see a nice couple dancing and hanging out, I'll go talk to them and say, hey, listen, I'm doing the story for the New York Times. Can I photograph you guys just doing your thing or you guys are sitting here, it's a great view and your people watching, do you mind if I get some shots of you doing that? And people are usually pretty agreeable. And if they're not, I just find somebody else. So then I finish the night off. I usually, I usually finish it off, have a beer somewhere and and then I go back to my hotel room and I back everything up. I'm meticulous about that. Again, two locations, look at my images for the day, see what I have. I start to sequence it a little bit. I start to put things together. I look at my captions, make sure I've got everything written down. All my notes have been taken properly. If I have any questions, I'll ask my fixer. I'll text my fixer the next morning over coffee. I'm looking at what I've captured, looking at the story, making sure I've got a well-rounded story, double checking my list, making sure I have everything on my list, make sure I've also you know, got some creative shots, a good lead shot, a nice detail shot. Uh, a good establishing shot, all that kind of stuff. I just, I take a really hard look and then I do, since it is a one day assignment and I'm only supposed to be shooting for one day, I mean, it's not like a rule, but I'm only getting paid to shoot one day. I still like to shoot the next morning just because again, more sunsets, more opportunities for me to get nice pictures, more opportunities to tell the story well and to impress your editor and to get more work from that editor. So 
Again, even a one day story, I'm probably shooting three days out of it. So I backed everything up and looked at everything I've got. I will wake up again the next morning at, at about for sunrise the same time and go back and shoot anything I missed. Or if I really got everything on my list, I'll just try to just, just go and shoot naturally. Just wander the streets and see what else I can find to match. Sometimes that's when I actually get my best shots. And on Friday, what I'll try to do is book my ticket in the afternoon, usually around the time I have to check out so that I can sort of save that awkward time of just like having all my bags and nowhere to go. So I usually book a flight around noon the next day. I will shoot all morning sunrise, go back to my hotel around 10, get out of there in time to check out and then get off to the airport and I'm done. And on the plane, I start to work on the images, tone them, uh, very light toning in the New York Times, just doing basic color stuff and start to caption. I'm looking at my notes, I'm captioning, I'm sequencing, and I'm typically uploading later that day at my house. So I'll get back to my home office, I finish my toning, I'll switch everything over to my desktop maybe, or I'll just keep it on my laptop, it depends where I feel like working. Caption everything, double check everything, upload to my editor, and basically I'm done. From there, I'm done. Sometimes my editor will have follow-up questions, often they do. Sometimes they needle it that day and then the story doesn't run for a few weeks or so you're working your butt off just to caption everything and get it done. But that's just, that's not always their fault. It's just a matter of things get pushed back and things change and timelines change and deadlines change. But I just like to get everything off to them as fast as possible. And if my editors have any questions, they can ask me. They have a server I upload everything to. So if I shot for three days, I'll probably have like a thousand images. I, I, I shoot a lot and I shoot with two cameras, different focal lengths. Um, but I will, I'll upload typically 50 to 100 pictures, depending on the story. For maybe 100, it really depends on the variety. It depends on how many locations. But let's say, let's say about 100 photos I upload. If they need more of something or want more of something, I will send it. But I look at the best shots from each location. I try to give a good mix of everything. And then it's just kind of wait. You know, you, you don't typically get like a great pat on the back. It's no fault of these editors. They just work with hundreds of photographers around the world. They've got a lot of stories going at once. So you might have worked your butt off. You might have had a hard time getting access. Travel stories, not so much. But you'll typically just get like an email from someone saying, we got the pictures. Or sometimes you get like great thumbs up. So, you know, it's not the kind of job where you're getting a lot of pats on the back and you're getting a lot of... Uh, reassurance is fine. It's just kind of what you signed up for when you do this stuff. So then later on, honestly, sometimes it's a week later. Sometimes it's a month later. I've even had it a year later. Your story finally gets, your story finally gets published and you get to see it in print. And it's always like a nice surprise. It's quite different than other kinds of work. They're a lot of fun to shoe. I've had a great time doing it. I just wanted to share with you guys that kind of stuff because people have always asked me, what's it like to do a travel story? So I thought this would be a fun example of what it's like to actually do a travel story for a major publication. For those of you that have any questions, if you're a budding photographer and you want to get these kind of assignments, you want to ask me questions, ask me in the comment section. That's fine. I'm happy to, happy to answer that kind of stuff. Ask it publicly so other people can learn. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this today. It was a lot of fun. Let me know what you think. And again, any questions in the comment section, like, share, and subscribe. Bye, guys.